So um, can I first of all just uh, thank Maria, Dasana and Paul for fantastic presentations detailing um, their work at the University of York. And I'd like to <clears throat> thank the audience for the questions that are coming in um, through the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screens. And please, uh, please do continue to send in your questions um, during this Q&A session, which will last for approximately um, 30 minutes. Um, I think what I'd like to do is, is start the, the Q&A session by directing a question to each of our speakers, the same question actually. So one of the things that struck me um, whilst listening to all of your talks was um, the, the importance of partnership working in, in all of your work and all of your research. And I really would just ask you to share your reflections for 30 seconds, a minute or so on, um, the importance of partnership working, the challenges you face, um, and how you think we can um, maximize partnership working moving forward. So perhaps we'll just start in the order you spoke. So Maria, can I come to you first? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, but yeah, this is a really very important area. So I think one of the most important things that we need to consider with our research is why are we doing it? And actually, whilst it might be really interesting to do research in a really uh, fascinating area, there's no real point in doing that unless there's a chance for it to actually have an impact. So with our work in schools and with children, early year settings, we want the impact to be realized in those settings, of course. And we can't really do that in isolation. So we have to very early start working with relevant partners and stakeholders. So some of these help us decide what's important in the first instance, but many of them are there throughout so that at the end they can share share our, our knowledge but different partners have different functions you know uh, we do work with the food foundation who are there with us telling us what's important and then helping us to disseminate but we also I, I have a partnership board for another project that's really looking at whole school approaches to food um, and we make sure that we we include in that board different partners that have different functions. So it includes, for example, Department for Education. Now, clearly they have a seat around the table with decision-making, um, but we also include head teachers because head teachers are there enacting some of the in interventions that we're developing. So I totally agree. Partnership is, is absolutely crucial to make a difference. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Dusana, can I invite you to comment? Thank you. Um, so it is the same uh, in our project, absolutely. I resonate with a lot of what Maria said. So from the start over the last 20 years, since we started doing this uh, type of research, we have been closely collaborating with schools, providing feedback on what is manageable, what kind of training uh, is manageable in schools, when should it happen, how it should be delivered to make sure that all these different types of findings that we have are readily um, ready to translate into practice but i have to say the paths to impact and, and changing uh, our education system for example are not simple it is not an easy task so a lot of the work we have done has been with policy makers uh, i was a consultant on development of health of health and well-being areas of learning in, in the new welsh curriculum and actually some of the research that i have presented um, and particularly the formulation of the two capacities has been heavily formulated based on my experience working with policymakers, where uh, we have been struggling in formulating uh, a well being policy that would be effective because our understanding, the research understanding of well being development and, and understanding of the capacities that make us say that we are well or make us say that we are satisfied with our life is not uh, sufficient at the moment. So we are really trying to contribute to this understanding from a developmental perspective so that uh, we can ground the development of the curriculum in a, in a systematic way, which we are for the most part not doing. So we are develop developing and, and delivering interventions in a very patchy way for a couple of months and then moving on to another intervention and another one without looking at how they can be effectively combined across and how they support learning and so on and so forth. So we have been doing this and now we are closely collaborating actually uh, with one of the key providers of guidance on PSHE training in schools. And, and that seemed to be 
uh, possibly uh, one of the most effective ways we can impact practice. And at the same time, we are in discussion with policymakers, but it, it is not easy. And at the same time, uh, we are also feeding into UNESCO policy. So the policy that I have mentioned, uh, we, we have just finished our contribution to their assessment on how to best support education across the UNESCO member states. Uh, and, and we contributed our research on the science of flourishing. So this will be uh, distributed to all the governments uh, in the 193 countries. Um, who are members of UNESCO. So we are trying different ways, uh, but, but often uh, some of the collaboration is not as straightforward as we would like it to be, and the impact and translation into policy is, is not easy. Yeah, thanks, Dasana. And, and Paul, I think um, you know, the list of uh, contributors and partners on one of your slides was, was significant, and, and I'm sure um, the challenges around interacting with overseas governments are, 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 are are not insignificant either. So we're really interested to hear your views. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so I guess you know, re research, you know, in whatever field that research uh, is, to ultimately impact lives and well-being beneficially, it needs to affect decisions uh, somewhere. So we've heard, I think, in the three presentations about decision making. Uh, in schools, in government policy in the UK, and government policy in Africa or, or, or internationally. Um, so we need to consider if we want our research to lead to benefit, uh, how it can affect decisions. And that's why partnership is, is, uh, is, is important. Um, sometimes those decisions are not imminent. They might be years or even decades down the line, but we need to understand to some degree uh, what those decisions uh, are. Um, but that takes time um, to, to build partnerships and um, we, there's a requirement to build trust and understanding. Um, and I think two things which are very important is kind of scale of projects uh, and longevity of, of engagement. So these are things which are, uh, are very difficult to do in single research projects. Uh, but I think for a university like York, if we can plan appropriately, we can get to sufficient scale uh, and have longevity of partnerships such that uh, the impact which we desire can be uh, can be uh, achieved, um, but it's quite a different model from research often than kind of sole uh, academic uh, model. Uh, and linked to that, I'd like to really emphasise the importance uh, of program management um, and uh, administrative staff really being embedded and core um, parts contributing fully. To, to research projects. And this is what we've benefited from uh, hugely. Uh, our project management and admin team uh, is, is great uh, and is just as even more important uh, uh, in many ways than the research team. Uh, and I think we, we really need to recognize that and think going forward, uh, how we can ensure that uh, as academics, we're supported um, continually by project management, uh, which understands the intricacies of um, both the research, but also uh, how that leads to partnership and, and impact. Um, so that's going forward, that's something I'd, I'd, I'd like to see, kind of a firmer commitment to project management, being aligned to research projects at the, at the university. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thank you. Um, Maria, I wonder if I could come back to you. We've had a number of questions around um, the, the sort of foods that, that were provided for the children in, in the project, you know, the nutritional value, and then also linking onto that about um, how the children were educated about those foods and were they taught to, to, to um, skills to, to, to cook and prepare food for when they're not at school? Yes, no, thank you. A question that I get asked quite a lot. So I'm very happy to, to address this. So first of all, in terms of the sorts of foods that were provided then, uh, so there was a requirement uh, that all of the programmes did implement schools that met the existing school food standards. Now, how they did this varied tremendously and very much depended on how they implemented the program at a whole. So, for example, those that chose to work with schools were able to utilize you know, canteens, etc., in the schools, not the school staff. And I think I didn't get an opportunity to say that before. So whereas there may have been some members of the existing school team that were happy to do this in the school holiday, uh, that was certainly not the model that most people took. Uh, so it's using the resources and, and again, a partnership with the schools to support engagement with parents, but not necessarily involving the school staff unless they wanted to. Now, of course, there were many situations where they weren't able to do this. 
uh, because they weren't working in partnership with schools, but they were quite innovative. And some of them uh, had mobile vans that, that came in or used at other facilities. So it was really varied. Um, there was a requirement to try to get hot meals to each child, which wasn't met. Um, I'd say from what we observed, probably about just over half of, of the, of the uh, programmes did provide a hot meal. So that's something that certainly needs more improvement. Uh, however, what was provided um, uh, did still meet the standards. Those that were really creative and innovative brought in the community around them. And that's something that we observed quite a lot. Uh, and invited members of the community, including the parents, to come in with food and sort of sort of um, talk about the food, bring in different cultures, learn, learning how to cook the food together before they all ate together. And in some situations, they did this alongside the community members as well. So it wasn't just the children uh, sitting in isolation. Uh, and that was really important because, and that does relate to the second point to your question. Uh, and that is that if you are living on a very low income, Sometimes you would see it as a risk to buy foods that your children haven't tried before uh, because, you know, you're balancing decision making on, a, on an everyday basis uh, against shall I spend money on food versus can I can I afford to do that against do I need to, to buy anything else and I mentioned heating as a key one there. This is consistent, by the way, so there's been big programs of work across across Europe um, exploring this and consistently shows that families living on a low income spend a lot more time thinking about food than those that aren't living on a low income. Uh, and, and again, it's a complex area. So actually that component of the programmes we saw to be uh, really important. Um, and we, from many different sources, heard that children were happy to try new foods and then go home and say, actually, this, that was really good. Can we have this at home? What I do want to emphasize though, is that in order to get a free place on these programs, you had to be eligible for free school meals. Now to be eligible for free school meals, you have to have a family or household income of less than 7,400 pounds a year. Okay, so we're talking about families living on a very low income here. And the data show us very consistently, those families experience hunger. So this is not just about adequate uh, dietary quality, this is about hunger as well. So it is hugely complex and um, I do appreciate that, that you know that many of us would say I can get fresh fruit and vegetables it's not that expensive <laughs> it, it, it's sort of a, with the bigger picture or with the food system which is what I mentioned before it all of a sudden becomes a little bit more complex so what we know is that families that live uh, in, in uh, on a low income tend to be living in an environment where they can't just pop across the road and buy a, you know fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables from a big supermarket they tend to have uh, local stores where fruits and veg are uh, not, you know, they, they don't last as well, do they? So it depends on how much they sell them, but they're more expensive. So if you're living on that, that level of income, you are also less likely to have um, transportation, uh, which you would have to then pay for to go to a bigger supermarket to buy those other foods. Now, this is also very important. Now, you might decide that you want to do that. And this is why I started the whole presentation like this. You could well decide that. But what's the risk of you doing that? So uh, you need to be absolutely certain that your children are going, are going to eat that. Otherwise, it's wasted money, wasted food. Um, and then just to say as well is that when you're hungry, the priority is getting food in and getting energy and energy density of fruits and vegetables is less, of course, unfortunately, than, than other foods. So there's, lot, there's lots of different things to factor in. There's the amount of money, is the, it's the environment that you're surrounded by, which by the way, also means that you've got more fresh food, uh, more fast food restaurants around you. Mm. Um, some of them, some of the research in this area shows you can feed a family for less than a fiver, by the way. So, um, you know, it's quite a substantial difference. So yeah, lot, lots to think about. Yeah, thanks, Mary. I mean, I think that 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 concept of understanding the perspective of the people facing these challenges is really, really important, I think, for not just the general public, but for policymakers. And, and I think the points you make are, are so valid. We've had some comments in the in the Q&A about, you know, buying fast food and, 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 and surely for the price of fast food, you can buy more healthy foods. But I think you've articulated really beautifully the, the challenges and the perspective of people in this situation and why sometimes those choices are not as straightforward as they might seem to us. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I just, just to also say that um, the chances of them having a very big fridge freezer as well, which would be a great idea, uh, are, also, are also lower. Yeah.
Yeah, no, thank you. Dasana, can I come to you? We've had a few questions um, around um, when do we start educating children um, about mental health and, and prevention and, and how do we do that? Um, so I wonder if I could just hear your views, you know, is, how early is too early or is that not even a, an issue? Is it, is it earlier the better? Absolutely, the earlier the better. So obviously I focused on education uh, in my talk, um, but the best way to start is actually with children uh, who are, uh, when, when parents are, when the mother is still pregnant. So actually starting that early, because we know that actually parental stress uh, during children's early development, as early as being in the womb, uh, can impact on their lifelong uh, trajectories. So there are some efforts to support parents um, of children um, while, uh, while the child is developing um, prenatally uh, to, to develop these skills so that they can reduce their stress and they can uh, also perhaps uh, development of these skills can reduce the likelihood of uh, postnatal depression and so on and so forth. So as early as possible, absolutely. So um, prenatally and from birth, um, and how can we do that? So I, I just want to make one point because I don't know whether, whether that was clear enough in my presentation. It is not about necessarily knowledge, it is about skills. Yeah. And this is what yeah. we often miss. This is, uh, this is what most of the guidance that we provide in schools uh, is, is targeting. We just think that uh, giving children or young people enough knowledge about how uh, they can look after their well-being or what is important and they should not engage in risk behaviors and so on. That's enough and it is not. And this is why the neuroscience is very helpful. It, it shows us sensitivities to different types of guidance at different points in life. It shows us how actually uh, uh, developing skills. What do I do uh, when I feel sad? How do I recognize that I feel sad? What do I do in such a situation? And not just signposting. So that's for uh, recognizing mental health problems, but prevention is about developing skills where we, we recognize how we feel and we skillfully manage what is happening to us, all those ups and downs, and, and we develop targeted abilities to do so through fostering these capacities. And we are definitely not doing that sufficiently in schools, often in primary schools particularly, we don't go beyond just, just uh, emotional awareness, so, so teaching children to recognize their emotions, but we don't tell them what to do other than, oh, speak to someone. And, and we know that uh, speaking to someone obviously is very important, but um, actually training these skills, uh, giving them strategies, techniques that they can use uh, to, to manage their mental health well-being from recognizing, oh, I have been on, on, on social media for this long and it is not making me feel good. So what can I do and how can I shift my attention to something else? And what are the activities that actually make me feel better? Uh, through talking and discussion. Um, and and um, I think we have lots of missed opportunities in our education, uh, including uh, not only PSHE lessons, but also other subjects, this can be done throughout education, through the approach, how, how kind of adults interact with children because they often copy our coping strategies, our behavior, through teaching them targeted strategies, through discussions, uh, let's say in subjects such as RE or, or through literature about meaning and purpose in life. I was just teaching a lecture actually a few, few weeks back uh, to my students and I asked them, how many of, of them had any discussion during their education about sense of purpose in life? And all of them said they did not. And I think this is very sad. There is research showing that uh, those young people who have greater sense of purpose in life, they are much less likely to, to have depression symptoms. These are active ways to actually influence the long-term trajectories of mental health and well-being of young people. Yeah, thanks, Dasana. There's a few questions just talking about um, different subgroups of, of children, perhaps you know, very young, school-aged children, adolescents, maybe subgroups, uh, particularly gifted children, you know, who have a slightly different set of challenges, perhaps. Do you think the, I mean, your research suggesting that the, the strategies are similar for all these subgroups, or do you think they need to be tailored differently? Mm -hmm. It's an excellent question. So um, ideally for, for these approaches to be effective, uh, we would have universal interventions delivered to whole classes regardless of children's abilities in a way that is accessible for children with range of abilities. 
but then uh, it would be ideal if they were complemented with small group work or individual work uh, targeting students with particular uh, gifts or challenges. So they can be effective for both, but the challenges or how they are applied, uh, they might be slightly different across the different contexts than for children with learning disabilities, for children uh, who are gifted. So uh, supporting them effectively um, as a whole and then in targeted um, way would be the most effective way to do so. And for the most part, again, we are not doing that currently. Okay, thanks. Thanks to Sol. Paul, if I could come back to you. Uh, there's a specific question here around um, what extent do outside forces, particularly economic forces, influence the long-term plans of the countries that you've been working in? Great. Um, fa fa thanks, Mike. Um, so yeah, there's a few, a few, thanks for the question, a few related um, questions um, uh, th there. Uh, in terms of, I just want to be clear in terms of what we see our role uh, as being in informing policy. So we're um, uh, now academics, we're independent uh, universities. So we try to get um, as close to enough uh, close enough to policy um, to both inform but to hold to account uh, policymakers whilst remaining uh, sufficiently aware uh, to ensure kind of independence and focus on on, on high quality um, uh, uh, research. And there's some questions in, in respect to policymaking in Malawi, but I think this um, also comes to kind of the in, in, international and outside uh, influences uh, as well. So I highlighted uh, in the presentation how uh, Malawi is particularly dependent uh, upon uh, donor funding um, for for healthcare, particularly certain forms of healthcare. HIV uh, comes to mind uh, in, in in particular, which limits um, the space for for choice uh, to a large extent at the national uh, level. So uh, already in terms of um, uh, outside economic force in the form of uh, aid, uh, health aid, uh, there's uh, a real influence and. Um, a quite a challenging relationship in some ways, but one which Malawi has to use uh, to be able to uh, fulfil uh, uh, healthcare. So I, I, I highlighted in my last um, response how the aim of research is to affect decision making, and we need to think uh, uh, about what the kind of focal point of that decision making is. Uh, and we, in our programme, have focused particularly at national level decision making. But when the choice set is influenced by um, you know, international um, forces. It also then obviously leads to what does that mean for informing uh, uh, international um, decision making in respect of uh, the allocation of, 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 of health aid. Um, and we've, we've, we've gone into that area, uh, but we've been able to say something constructive uh, about that uh, because the analyses are grounded at the national level, closer to uh, beneficiaries. Uh, of, of, of health aid. So one thing we've we've found, and we don't, we've argued strongly for, with particularly um, with the with the um, primary investigator in Malawi uh, and colleagues in, in in Africa, is that many of these international choices are not tailored to the priorities uh, as facing uh, facing the, the, the country, and particularly when international agencies are looking for greater resource commitments from the country the effect of international aid can actually act, sometimes be adverse when it le leads to a shift in, uh, uh, shift in priorities uh, 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 away from greatest needs. Um, so that's at the moment, if that's happening, and that's been the case for the last five, ten years and going onwards, that's a challenge with this. But I think what the last two years uh, have shown is that uh, Malawi and other countries um, in Africa, but uh, particularly in uh, the most resource-constrained parts of the world, um, do are at the mercy of economic uh, changes, but also other shocks. Pandemic uh, is is the one which, uh, of course, uh, we'd be faced with, and maybe future pandemics in in future. Um, to be honest, our our field um, as up to this point has focused a little bit on kind of a maybe status quo uh, notion. Now, how do we make the best of where we are now? But I think what we've learned from the last few years is that this notion of resilience of systems. That needs much more attention and care, and that's something that we're planning now to, to go into. How can 
um, uh, health services be uh, be designed such that re re they're resilient to shocks, whether they are economic changes in available funds, pandemic, uh, or maybe uh, uh, other forms of shocks and natural disasters and stuff. So it's um, yeah, it's uh, it's something where not that much has been done to date, but uh, I think it's going to be a really important area going forward. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I wonder if I could just change tack slightly and just talk about some of the the healthcare in the in the country. And and you talked about it was something that really. Um, is dear to my heart, this shift from focusing on single disease to, to holistic care, really, you know, viewing, viewing patients in the context of their own lives and their own systems. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that and perhaps comment on if there's any learning we can take from the work you've done in Malawi to, to apply to the UK, because obviously we're starting to, to think more about shifting care out of hospitals into communities and perhaps taking that trajectory ourselves. Yeah, thanks, mate. I, I think um, it's really the, the potential um, for learning in multiple directions is, is really huge. Um, and self-care, um, self-testing, for instance, is, uh, is used for many, um, used particularly for HIV and other uh, disease in Africa. It's only really recently where people have become very aware of, of self-testing in the context of of, of, of COVID, equally uh, community management of, of, of diseases, differentiated care, so uh, individuals are not required uh, to routinely travel often very large distances in the African context, less here, but still the time and uh, travel costs to access care. All, all of these are lessons which um, will flow from the south to the north and, and the UK uh, in, uh, in, 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 in many cases. Um, and so again within our work how for a country such as malawi uh, which relies on external sources of funds for much as much of its healthcare, how 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 does this work uh, currently how, how has it worked in the past uh, often there's been an issue uh, in the lancet um, expressing a need that we need to scale up hypertension treatment or um you know, cares for um maternal care cancer there's always a, a an, and and that that plays upon, um, it's a motive. Healthcare, which people need, should be there in all places at all times. Um, and this underinvestment in healthcare and it, as well as in mental health and, uh, and good nutrition. So it's sometimes uh, easy to look at a particular um, requirement and focus on scaling that up. Um, and that, given the, the, the structure uh, of funds, that, compounds that situation. Um, so for HIV, TB and malaria, we have the Global Fund. For instance, for maternal care, there's an organisation which is run out of the World Bank called uh, Global Financing Facility. There are others for, um, for other healthcare conditions. And each of these uh, funders have kind of a fairly narrow remit and they're pushing these priorities on, and countries can't cope. So what we have tried to do with our work with colleagues uh, in Malawi and Africa is to ground uh, the analyses uh, at the national level, but more than that, seeing what alternative healthcare arrangements could look like uh, for, um, for, for, for individuals, patient-centred care, uh, uh, using the term that you used. Um, and this, this is, it, it's not easy, uh, it's because there are so many interactions across um, uh, disease areas and across the systems and pools of funds. So it, it requires uh, studying uh, analyses to be undertaken under uh, uh, over over a number of years uh, and trying to um, uh, better get a grip on these complex complexities but we feel that this is so crucial um to the experience of engaging in healthcare and, and population health outcomes that result um, particularly the equity uh, of those health outcomes that's a direction we have to say we've been fortunate in our program that i think we've pushed um the analyses and the modeling well, we certainly have pushed further uh, then has been undertaken anywhere, in, including in, in countries such as the UK. Um, so we think that the approach that we've adopted uh, can can also be adopted in in the NHS and elsewhere in future. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thank you. Um, so we've probably got time for maybe one more round of questions, um, if that's okay. So Maria, can I come to you? One of the things that, um, sorry, uh, yeah, Maria, one of the things that struck me um, in your talk was the power of the voice of the young people. Um, and I just wondered if you might say something about the importance of that and perhaps how we could try and amplify that. We've had some comments about perhaps we need a third house in Parliament, the House of Youth, 
Um, and, and that sounds like a great idea to me, but um, I just wonder what your thoughts were um, around that and, and, and in the context of the work you've done. Yeah, thank you. What a great idea that would be. Yeah. Um, what, what I would say is that politicians do listen, right? If the right young person speaks at the right time, we have some evidence now that that does seem to, they do seem to listen. Whether that makes a difference, we still don't really know. There are local youth councils of us as well, so youth parliaments that young people can get involved in. Um, I've been quite lucky over the last few years that I've had opportunity to work alongside lots of young people, uh, specifically, sorry, specifically about um, in relation to food systems and welfare. Um, they are articulate, they know what they're talking about. Um, now, what, what I would say, and I, I've just recently written a blog about this because I feel quite passionate about this, is that where, where the responsibility sits needs to be considered. So I do hear young people themselves saying, you know, we've got, we've got to get ourselves out of this for our future. Well, whilst I appreciate that, <laughs> uh, what I would say is, uh, I don't think it is their responsibility. However, they do have a voice and that can enact change where people who truly are responsible, so our leaders, our government leaders, uh, should be listening to them. Um, and um, it's quite often it's done in partnership with celebrities as well. So obviously we, we mentioned Marcus Rashford earlier. He works alongside the young ambassadors that are um, supported by the Food Foundation through which now Christina O'Dane and the rest of those young people um, are really active you know they, they are on a regular basis if you're if you're interested in this you know you, you can you can hear all about what they're doing they're very active in in this field um, uh, and then there's people like Emma Thompson that have you know gone and knocked on number 10 with with some of those young people as well and of course Jamie Oliver and I'm, I'm fortunate that I can work work with all of those young people so what we're doing in Yorkshire, though, is we're trying to build our own uh, our own uh, leaders for change as well. Uh, and I can tell you, I've been trying to engage. I'm a nutritionist, by the way, background, and I've been trying to engage young people for a long time now about nutrition. Uh, you know, you get you get some interest, but it's a lot harder than asking them about climate change. Um, so what we're doing at the moment is we're build, you know, we're building upon the passion in climate change with the need to think about food systems, which of course are, are very, very related. Uh, and so really excited now we've been able to meet our young people in person for the first time. Uh, because of the situation and again that was the clip that I showed at the end they're, they're all very passionate about this so what's really important though is that to make to to make sure that you take them seriously this is not tick box I guess this is similar to what some people do when they talk about public and patient involvement this is meaningful engagement uh, and that you're constantly feeding back to them um, you're taking their messages on, on board um, uh, yeah, and if, if nobody's doing this kind of work at the moment, it's, it's very satisfying. Um, and I truly feel that it really does make a difference. Yeah, great. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, Dasana, I, I wanted to ask you about the, the work you've done around the mental health of, of the teachers um, in the schools. And um, there was a question around whether the, the focus on assessment of, of young people contributed to the, the sort of poor mental health of teachers. I mean, the figures you quoted were quite astonishing. You know, was it seventy nine percent had problems with mental health? Um, and then I'd just like you to think, maybe comment on um, the culture and education. One of the things I've been involved in during the pandemic is the the culture in the NHS around its attitudes towards well being and how it supports its staff. And I just wondered what your thoughts were about that in the education sector. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. It's a very good question. So, by the way, these staggering numbers, I, I obviously mentioned them on purpose, but it's not a news. So if you look at the statistics consistently over the last uh, five, ten years, 80% uh, of, of teachers uh, have um, report poor mental health, have trouble sleeping, so on and so forth. And we know how it impacts on our performance uh, at work. So how can they support young people effectively if they themselves are not well and nearly half of them says that they often go to work when they are not well so do assessments contribute to that um, what is clear is that their overload is a top reported stressor so when you ask them what they are stressed about what is the source of dissatisfaction for them overload absolutely and what is contributing to the overload is our over focus on 
assessment, often changes in assessment being made without uh, teachers having input into that. Um, there, is a, there is a sense actually of, um, of lack of autonomy, of uh, they, they feel uh, sometimes a little bit cynical about their voices just not being heard. They do whatever is told to them to do, but there is lack of autonomy and, and lack of input or lack of effective feedback between what teachers think and how they feel uh, and, and the policy makers. So absolutely, we do, we do need to do more. There is, it does link back to the culture. Um, so there is an, again, the problem is that some of the uh, perspectives on the culture and education and what we want to do with education shift with, uh, with political landscape and who, who is in charge. So if you, for example, look in Wales, their focus is a little bit less on assessments and they are even revising assessments now actually based on the new curriculum including assessments where they have a whole stream focusing on uh, the health and well-being skills. Um, so, so they are a little bit ahead of us uh, and actually worldwide. So there was one question in the comments about whether we can learn from other countries. Well, to some extent, but actually we have looked at policies across uh, the world and there just isn't a clear guidance on how to develop these well-being skills. At least we haven't come across any in any country. So, Wales is a little bit ahead uh, in this regard. Uh, here in England, we are very much focused on, on Ofsted assessments and, and they are very much focused on, um, uh, on, on academic performance, even though there have been some shifts towards developing the whole person, it is not reflected enough in assessment of schools. So it is a complex landscape and, and um, some, even some economists and some, uh, some researchers looking at the whole system do suggest that the overemphasis on our individualistic success is a major, uh, major uh, stumbling block uh, in supporting effectively mental health and well-being in schools. Teachers still often, uh, let's say, it's kind of uh, they uh, rely on um, fear when they are motivating students. If you don't do well on your A levels, what is going to happen? How is your career going to be impacted, and so on and so forth? So. So it is a whole system question. It is a culture question. There is a shift towards whole school approaches now, which is a positive thing in England, where we want to impact the way uh, teachers interact with students, the interactions with community. I think actually Maria's project is a very good example of how school engagement was utilized there. So doing something similar effectively in schools, uh, changing the ethos of schools uh, is important, but how can we do that if the policy still emphasizes assessment? And, just final point I want to make, uh, one uh, piece of research from my lab done by one of my PhD students uh, highlights or looked into worries of students, these were sixth formers during the pandemic. And you, you might think that some aspects of, of their experience during the pandemic would be their uh, most uh, biggest worry. Uh, however, it was still for majority of them, the biggest worry were the assessments. So what does it tell us? And it's a major source of stress for them. Um, so what does it tell us? We really need to look back and, and assess and understand that supporting mental health and well-being is not at cost of supporting learning and uh, and um, long-term uh, long-term kind of um, um, prospects of young people with regards to their education. We really need to understand that, and and still there is lack of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Dasana. So, um, Paul, if I can um, come back to you. Um, I was struck at the end of your talk by the, the, the fact that you um, were, were expanding the work that you're doing into other African countries, particularly into West Africa. Um, and there was a question around the outcome measures of the work you'd done in Malawi and whether they could be used or what they were and what, whether they could be used to, to support the work going into, uh, into West Africa. Um, so I was just interested in, in and yeah, tell, tell me a bit more about those outcome measures and, and whether the learning can be directly translated from Malawi to other African countries. Uh, th thanks, Mike. And um, again, I'm just looking at the uh, question about that may relate also to, um, there's a question I see on um, the suitable approaches for project management in contexts mm. uh, such, as, su su such as Malawi. Um, so context uh, and uh, culture is 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 vital uh, uh, really of course is you can't um, get any system or a uh, piece of research and directly transfer that that's a that's the wrong way um, to, to to do it instead it's about uh, grounding work 
uh, within a context and trying to shape uh, research on a demand and uh, context uh, specific and suitable uh, uh, means. Um, so in terms of the chat bar uh, question, um, yes, project management uh, systems do differ um, somewhat. There are different cultures, even different cultures within the UK, between the university sector and the private sector or, uh, or, or the core public sector. Um, so this solution uh, will be uh, determined um, uh, locally. To give an example uh, there, I think um, the way we work is, is, is much more informal. Um, and I think we know from our work in, in Malawi that formality and hierarchy uh, has an important role. Uh, and you know, once you understand uh, how that works, you can, you can find a way of um, contributing within the system um, and um, collaborating uh, more effectively. In terms of uh, taking the work from Malawi, uh, contributing in, in other uh, uh, African settings, again, to emphasize this is, this is demand driven, demand, demand led. Um, but one of the things that we found important in engaging uh, policymakers and even politicians um, in East Africa uh, is that, yes, uh, Malawi has been the large focus of our work um, to date, but it hasn't been the sole focus. Uh, and engaging regionally uh, has been important. And I'll give a, a good example of, of that. Following the opening of, um, of the Health Economics Unit, at the University of Malawi, which sits with the university, but actually involves secondment of civil service staff uh, to that unit, and hence is a bridge uh, between uh, research and policy making. Uh, the Ministry of Health in, uh, in Uganda uh, asked for um, such a unit within their uh, context, and that's since uh, opened and been delivered, and uh, work is taking place to, to shape important health policies in, 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 in Uganda, but that's demand driven from Uganda. Um, and in a similar way, um, we, the team, this is collectively the team of, of, of partners have been approached by the universities in Senegal um, uh, and Ghana, ministries of health, requesting support for um, similar um, training in health economics and research uh, capacities. And also with a view to um, maybe having a similar type of health economics unit within, within those countries. The way we've gone about that uh, is that uh, those individuals who approached us uh, uh, have developed reports uh, in terms of the, their vision for how the discipline of health economics and related um, uh, disciplines could make best contributions to, to health policy. And those reports differ. You know, the, the, the setups are uh, designed for the context and the structure and the cultures uh, uh, within, within each of the, the, the countries. Uh, but the core challenges that our research uh, policy engagement capability building uh, addresses of how do you make best use of the limited budget and limited health system capacities given the almost overwhelming uh, 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 needs. That's uh, a, a challenge which is common across all countries. It's common to our own uh, country in the, in, in, in the UK uh, as well. And some of the major policy instruments um, to address that challenge uh, uh, can also uh, be used uh, across settings. It tends to be things such as uh, lists of priority clinical interventions or means to allocate budgets across geographies or designing contracts between payers uh, and uh, facilities to incentivize um, uh, su 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 suitable uh, care. So we've, we've delivered the, the research with uh, our partners and published that for work in Malawi and Uganda. And it's that that has generated interest in looking at the ways we, we, which we work in, in, in other contexts. Um, and I think working across countries is particularly useful because uh, it creates something of a, of a peer community um, uh, and uh, lots of uh, possibilities for kind of um, shared learning. Uh, and as we uh, discussed earlier in this uh, in this Q and A, transfer of, of, of methods and approaches um, into the UK and, and and across countries as well. Yeah, cool. thanks, Paul. Thank you. Um, so as we come to the end, I've got there's one final question in the in the chat that um, I thought I'd just put to you all very quickly at the end, and um, I hope you can answer it quickly. But um, obviously, we've got a lot of young people. We've got people who are um, in schools and at the beginning of their uh, careers on 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 the on on the on the webinar today, and there's a question there about what advice you might give someone who's starting out on their journey to improve healthcare, whether that be about grants or just a general approach. And I just wondered whether you could share your wisdom about that and your experience. So, um, Paul, maybe I come to you first, if that's okay. 
<laughs> yeah, sure, thanks. <laughs> we'll, uh, <laughs> pick on the spot. Um, so uh, I think it's important to um, say learn before doing. Um, so if you're working in a in a new area uh, uh, and if you want to make contributions in a new area, do, do that with uh, uh, an, an understanding that there's much more to learn initially uh, than you can contribute. Your contributions will come through time. So don't uh, put it on yourself that you need to um, you know, make major contributions uh, uh, immediately. Start small uh, uh, and work with relationships, make some contribution uh, um, and go from there and see where it takes. You don't have a have a view and a vision of where you'd like to uh, take your work and your studies and your research, uh, but, but don't work to that rigidly. Uh, Recognise that things will change uh, and, and be adaptive to those changes um, as, the, as, as they arise. Brilliant, thank you. I think learning and building relationships, sound advice, I think. Um, Dasana, any, any, any comments you would make on that? Um very similar to what perhaps Paul said, uh, starting where you are and what is possible. Uh, in, in our work, um, I, I was actually really impressed by the, the difference that uh, enthusiastic and informed teachers can make on the ground. So whether you are in a, in a position of, of leadership or whether you are in a position of, of working with young people day to day, uh, just learn more, learn more about what, what has been said, for example, in, in my talk, look into different resources, look at uh, different uh, strategies uh, and approaches that can be applied, think about how they can be expanded so that there is a translation uh, of, of the learning of, of young people into real world, so it's not just that half hour session they have in school. Uh, so wherever you are, as, again, just like um, Paul said, uh, learn more, understand what it is. And, and I really hope that talking about the mechanisms might be the two capacities, might be a good starting point. So often what teachers um, find was that they are just lost because people talk about resilience, they talk about mental health, they talk about grit, they talk about growth mindfulness, they talk about this framework and that framework. There are 136 social and emotional learning frameworks. How can we ask teachers to make sense of them if, if researchers are struggling to do so? Um, so what I was hoping is that by, by talking about these two key capacities, in a way, I simplified the task. If you want to make a difference, try to find ways to improve self-regulation and try, try to find ways to improve the self world capacity. And hopefully there were enough pointers in my presentation what to what these are, and go from there, look for resources out there and try to do it systematically uh, in a way that the translates into the real world and continues uh, through our development. Thanks, Susanna. Um, and Maria, final word for you, from you on this. Yeah, thank you. So I guess building upon that kind of learning, uh, what I would say is you have to care about what you're doing. It sounds like, it sounds really obvious, doesn't it? You're gonna, you know, whilst you should be adaptable and flexible to change throughout your career, ultimately, from my perspective, I want to do something that I really feel supports people, makes a difference, and has an impact. So I think that's my absolute 100, like my first thing that I would 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 recommend. So you you really need to be interested. But I think in this world, it's also really important to acknowledge that it's not an easy career path. Research is definitely not something that it feels like it, and maybe it felt like it did to start off with, but um, it's certainly not the easiest route and resilience is absolutely key here. So as we go through uh, an academic career, of course, we have to uh, support our work through grants, through publications, uh, and you know many of those aren't successful. You put your heart and soul into some of these, as I'm sure you're aware, and you know, quite often you, you, you're not successful. So it's kind of having that, that resilience, that ability to understand as well, that that is very likely uh, to, to happen to you. But if you're working in an area that's really important, I would say less so. Um, the other thing that um, I would definitely recommend people do is not be afraid to talk to people, regardless of what stage of their career or what position they have. Um, and, you know, people are just people, bottom line, uh, and engaging, building your profile, collaborating 
is uh, enjoyable, but is very, you know, is a, a really good way to, to, to build your career, whether that be through writing papers with people, building grant applications, uh, or even just sort of uh, uh, getting more impact out of your work. So yeah, def definitely uh, uh, be in it for the right reasons. I, I know it sounds obvious, but I know some people don't necessarily follow that, that notion. Be adaptable and flexible to change. Uh, but absolutely start thinking about engaging, collaborating and building your profile. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. So brilliant, I think, brilliant messages um, to finish this first session um, with. I, I guess my role as we close the session is really just to, to thank everyone. I want to thank our three speakers. Um, fantastic talks. And it's really clear that the work you do is, 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 is hard and difficult work, but important work and clearly fulfilling and it has impact. And I think, you know, that's that's my take home message that the work being done at the university is having real impact, not just in the UK, but globally. Um, um, so thank you for that. And we saw some differences between the work that you're doing, but actually there's a lot of similarities. And I think you probably all summed that up towards the end. And in fact, there were some comments in the in the talk about whether Maria and Desana should collaborate together and, and, and share. And I'm sure that has, that is happening in the background somewhere. So um, fantastic, thank you. Um, I wanna thank the, the, the audience, those people who've joined us this morning. Um, it, it, it's great to have so many of you with you with us and, and thank you for your fantastic questions and the time has just flown by and I'm sure we could have filled even more time. So thank you so much. And finally, I'd just like to thank the team at the University of York who've, who've helped to put this on. They've done a fantastic job um, and I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking and congratulating them. So this is the end of our session, but the, the day is far from over. York Talks is going to be running all day and the next session will start um, at 11.30. Um, and also, please just don't forget to have a look at our PhD um, research spotlight competition um, and vote for your favourite. And you can see that the, 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 the link to that has just appeared in the chat. So thank you. Thank you for the morning and have a great day. Goodbye, everyone.